Hello, my friends. Welcome back to Chapter 8. In this part, we're, we're going to start looking at these aqueous solutions and how they form reactions. And the first reaction that we're going to focus on are called precipitation reactions, where you take a couple of clear solutions or whatever, you put them together and they form a solid in addition to whatever liquid is left over. And so that has to do with a lot of interesting interactions between molecules. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at that first in this part and then in the next part we'll do some calculations. So if you think about two, two clear solutions that you're familiar with, salt water and sugar water. Okay, salt water is a homogeneous reaction with sodium chloride in water, and sugar water is a homogeneous mixture or solution of um, sucrose and water. So how do solids like this dissolve in water? And the rule is like dissolves like. Like dissolves like. So it has to be a similar, it has to have similar properties, I should say, uh, in order for that to occur. So when something dissolves, you have, you have to have a stronger interaction between the solute molecule and the solvent molecule than you originally had between the solute molecules. So if this is a solid, okay, and so notice it's in like a nice geometric form, then they are interacting with each other. The solvent molecules come in and start to pull these away. And if they are attracted more to the solvent molecules, then they will move away with the solvent molecules and they will dissolve. Remember when we talked about water before that it was a polar molecule. And that's because it had a partially negative end and a partially positive end. And so it formed poles, like the poles on a, on a magnet. So since water is polar and it has a negative end and a positive end, it's attracted to those opposite charges. So the negative end of the water is attracted to the positive ions such as sodium, the positive end of the water molecule is attracted to the negative ion. So when you have sodium positive chloride negative, it's a perfect solution. <laughs> okay, so when the ions are attracted, then they're going to be pulled away and they're going to be surrounded by the water molecules. And the water molecules, notice if this one is positive here, then the negative ends of the water molecule are going to orient towards that. Whereas the negative part of the sodium chloride is going to orient the water molecules with the positive ends towards it. And so this is repeated over and over again. And so these form this sphere of hydration, okay? And they surround it and it disappears, okay? And so the result is that you now have a solution with charged particles that are moving around in solution. And because they are charged particles, they can literally conduct electricity because electricity is, remember, movement of electrons. And because of that, they can form a solution called an electrolyte, an electrolyte solution. So if you have salt in water, it will carry an electrical current, okay, conduct it, and it will if you put it in series with a light bulb and, a, and you have something to charge, then it will light that light bulb up because it will carry that charge, okay? S sugar water will not. Sugar water is a non-electrolyte. Even though it's dissolving, it is not forming free-flowing ions like you see in an ionic salt such as sodium chloride. 
So in sodium chloride, we had this situation oriented with the positives and the negatives. In sugar water, there is a solute solvent interaction, but it's not because of charged particles. It's because of polar covalent particles. So we're not looking at ionic interactions, we're looking at covalent interactions in the sugar water. But because it does that, it is not giving these free ions up to float around. And so since you don't have any free ions, you have nothing to carry the electrons, and so it won't conduct electricity. So electrolytes can dissociate into ions. They can be strong electrolytes that completely dissociate in, into ions, such as sodium chloride or calcium chloride, where they completely turn into their component ions. Weak electrolytes partially dissociate. These you'll typically see weak acids and bases. Weak acids and bases partially dissociate into their ions. So they do make some ions, but the majority of it stays in the molecular or covalent form. Molecular forms that dissolve in water but do not form any ions are called non-electrolytes. So you have strong electrolytes that completely dissociate into ions. You have weak which partially dissociate into their ions, and then you have non-electrolytes, which do not dissociate into ions at all. And so ionic substances are gonna be strong electrolytes, sodium chloride, calcium chloride, things like that. Acids and bases, if it's a strong acid, it's gonna be a strong electrolyte. If it's a weak acid, it's going to be a weak elect electrolyte. So um, acetic acid, for example, is a weak acid. So it's going to be a weak electrolyte. Hydrochloric, sulfuric, nitric, you remember the list of our strong ones. They will all be strong electrolytes. That is why sugar doesn't conduct electricity, because it's a non-electrolyte. And most molecular compounds, covalent compounds, will, that will dissolve in water stay the same type of molecule they were. They're just surrounded by water molecules. Maybe some hydrogen bonding going on there. Hmm. So, and this just shows you with, you know, seeing a light bulb and, you know, the partial weak electrolyte might light it up just barely where you could see the filament. The strong um, ionic salt will be the strongest electrolyte and it will light that up. So just kind of a visual for you to see. And that's your introduction to ionic um, solutions whether or ionic and covalent solutions. And we're getting ready to talk about precipitation reactions and how it is uh, affected by solubility here in the next part.